There we go. Yeah, we're live. 317 is Saturday in the afternoon. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are doing well. Today I want to talk to you about, <laughs> oddly enough, really it's not. It's a twin turbo thing, so it's very, very cool. The Callaway twin turbo Corvette, the old one, the back started back in 1987. So I want to talk to you about that. The reason I want to talk about that today, one, it's a twin turbo thing because so it, that immediately makes it cool. In fact, since it's a twin turbo, it makes it twice as cool. But also, I just did a story on a turbo tune port setup that I tested way back. That I and I just did a story for the guys at Summit Racing. So you'll be seeing that that'll be coming out on their on all, all cylinders deal. But it's a and really it, I did that specifically because the I thought that the Callaway Corvette was so cool and I could never have one because I don't have Callaway Corvette money. But and but I was a Corvette owner. I've owned a couple of them. I've owned a '69 Tri Power 427 uh, briefly and then an '85 Corvette, so a, a, an L98. The first year of the L98, it was an iron headed version until they switched over to the aluminum head 86 for the convertible. And then they introduced it to the you know, rest of the Corvette team or the, the rest of the available Corvettes in 87. The Callaway was a, a regular production option, an RPO. And it was something that Callaway did that GM basically covered with a warranty, which is pretty cool. Or, or and, and, and or maybe Callaway helped cover that too but they did some fairly cool things to it and i wanted to talk about those and i wanted to figure out you know we could talk about what whether or not we thought that that was effective 130 times six Ooh, that's a lot so we're doing some calcs here 52 Okay. So here's the thing. Um, Callaway, the Callaway Corvette, to become a Callaway Corvette, they had a lot of other optional things like body panels and stuff. But really the thing that I was interested in primarily was it, the performance. And that's because of the motor. So if you venture back with me <laughs> to 1987, the standard Corvette was making 240 horsepower, I think 200 and yeah, 240 horsepower, I think, and 330 foot pounds. And it, it was not, I, I, I don't want to say saddled with, because I, I obviously I, I'm a big fan of the tune port injection. I think it's the best looking uh, factory induction system that Jim has ever put on anything. Maybe, maybe the dual quad on the Z28, but that was a that was more of a dealer option than a, a factory piece. So that that was very cool, also. But the tune port thing, I one of one of the best looking things. But because it was such a long runner intake manifold, it, it was designed to make lots and lots of torque, and to not make a ton of horsepower because it made this thing made peak power at forty eight hundred RPM. So it was not what you'd call you know your <laughs> a high RPM piece. Uh, and the Callaway, or, or at least when I ran my turbo, I, I've never dyno tested a Callaway Corvette. I, I'm assuming that it would do this because it, they they retain the factory tune port setup. And I think that the they retain the, they didn't do anything special to the heads, maybe springs or something, but I think that they use the factory cam. You guys correct me if you know anything about it. Um, the... Uh, I thought they use a factory cam. They use a factory ECU. And then the other thing I want to talk about today is they also use what's called a microfueler. So it's basically, basically it's a system to, to control additional injectors. So they had two injectors positioned after the intercooler blowing into where, where the two intercoolers, they're two bare cores. They have a, a Y that comes together and goes, goes in and feeds the factory throttle body. So they have two additional injectors spraying fuel in there controlled by this microfueler. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> the other thing that they did to this, uh, that Callaway did, is they lowered the compression pretty dramatically. They lowered it down to seven and a half to one. So right off the bat, it would take away a lot of performance in naturally aspirated trim, which in itself would also take away a bunch of boost response. Now, I don't remember reading exactly what size turbos they use on those. I'm sure that they were fairly small given the amount of power that they had or that they were trying to make. This thing would eventually make, I mean, it made uh, on the Callaway in 87, 
Let's see here. It made, uh, it was rated at 345 horsepower and 465 foot pounds. That would later go up to 382 horsepower and 562 foot pounds. And 562 foot pounds is, is a lot of torque. And so would should have no problem, you know, spinning the tires. Traction should be a major issue with that kind of torque. I'm, I'm curious if the, Somebody let me know if they know. I'm curious if the the Callaway Corvette required a manual transmission or if it was available with an automatic. And what automatic did they team with something that made 562 foot pounds? Was it still a, a 700 or or a 4L60? I think that I think they were 700s back then. I don't think that they were 200s, right? So somebody let me know. And so that that's an awful lot of torque to play with. But that what I want to talk about are a couple things. One is dropping the compression dramatically. Obviously, Callaway did that for a safety issue, and they did it so that people that are beating on these things, which they definitely would, um, so that they would let be less. They, they basically made their tuning window much wider, which I think was a good step, a good idea. And the reason that they think that that was a good idea is because they were relying on the microfueler <laughs> to, to add fuel which I think is not a good idea. I mean, it's probably the only thing that they could do back then and still get this thing emission certified because they were still running, the essentially they were still running the factory computer. And during the emissions loop that they would test this thing in, it was probably never activated. So it, it basically ran like a low compression, you know, L98 Corvette, which didn't have a problem with all of the cats and stuff meeting the emission standards back at that time. So that probably worked out fairly well. And I'm sure that that's why they teamed that. M my question is a couple of things. One, if we lower the compression down to seven and a half to one, we're going to change power dramatically. So if we think that it's three or 4% per one point in compression, and we're changing at a point and a half or two points, I mean, we're talking about 30 horsepower or more and somewhere near 45 to 50 foot pounds of torque that you're going to change the, the power output of that combination. It's a lot. <laughs> and the problem with this is, that, I mean, obviously with the turbo, you more than make up for it. I mean, they, they were making, even in the initial offering, they were making a hundred horsepower over the stock higher compression NA version. So they, they were making plenty of power and they were making another hundred foot pounds um, at, or more than a hundred foot pounds of torque over the original offering. So it was a pretty sizable change in power. You know, nobody's going to look at 345 horsepower on a twin turbo small block Chevy and go, wow, that's a lot of power anymore because we, <laughs> that's, that's essentially a, a factory LS1, you know, power output, not the torque, but the, 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 the horsepower output. So, you know, it's hard to look back and go, oh, that, that was a lot of power. But back then, that was a lot of power. Anytime you make 100 more than the thing that was originally offered, that's quite a, that's a sizable jump. And then when you went to 382, there's another, another 40 on top of that and another 100 foot-pounds of torque on top of that. So it's very, very cool. But he, he, here are the things. With the low compression, I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure that they did it to, to expand their tuning window and, and have the thing much less likely to hurt itself. It had, it had plenty of performance because of the turbos, and I'm told that they were running somewhere in the 10 to 12 uh, pounds of boost range, which is pretty good. Um, and they had the two bare intercoolers, although we could talk about whether or not the inter, uh, having intercoolers, even with ducting under the hood, not, not always a great idea. A front mount would have been much better, but would not have looked anywhere near as cool. Because when you open the, the hood of your Corvette and you see that on a Callaway, that's very, very visually impressive. Whether or not that's actually impressive in terms or, or effective in terms of power and stuff is, is another thing. Um, so the low compression definitely helped with that situation. So it helped if just in case they didn't have, you know, if a guy's legging this thing out on the auto bond or out in Nevada and, and is running it for a long period of time, they wanted to make sure that it was safe. In fact, I, I was reading, I uh, went, did a deep dive on Callaway stuff um, for the last couple of nights. And I was reading one of the things from Motor Trend where they tested it and, and they ended up melting it down when they were trying to do a top speed test with it. So it was, it didn't fare very well. I don't know that that's, ever, that's obviously not every one of them, but it did because uh, they were, you know, this is during the era where they were introducing the ZR1 also. So they were, they were constantly comparing those two. Was a, was a 
400 horsepower or it started out at 385 but was a 385 or a 400 horsepower zr1 motor the lt5 motor was that better and was that car faster than the callaway given the torque output i would think that a callaway should out accelerate a zr1 but the zr1 was <laughs> may have had more technology and may have had more fine tuning um and i never ever remember hearing about a ZR1 ever getting hurt during testing. So you guys can let me know if that was the case, but I don't ever remember reading about that. And back then I was pretty hip on all the testing that people were doing, not because I was involved in any of it. I still was doing dyno testing, but not, um, not for road and track or car and drive, but I read all that stuff because I was fascinated by it. And top speed was my thing. I like, like we would ever get to use it except when I would go to the silver state, but it's still very, very cool. But acceleration, especially with 562 foot pounds, that's a lot of torque. And you, and that thing should go, you know, almost instantaneously, but the low compression definitely would make the thing softer compared to the higher compression version which would hurt turbo response, but maybe it didn't really because the turbos were small enough. I mean, having twin turbos trying to make less than 400 horsepower with a 350 V8, you could really put small turbos on it that would very be very, very responsive if that's all you're trying to do. If you have two turbos that are trying to make, let's say you size them to make 250 horsepower a piece so that they could go to 500 if need be, um, those turbos would be really, really tiny and should be very, very, very responsive, even on a seven and a half to one 350. So that shouldn't be a problem. But <laughs> the microfueler, I don't think that that's a great idea. And I would almost guarantee, I remember reading the story for Motor Trend that the Callaway guy said, yeah, this, this just thing just got a bad batch of premium gas or whatever. Um, I would say the odds are much more likely that this microfueler doesn't really, uh, didn't really offer very good uh, air, uh, cylinder to cylinder distribution because it's injecting. And we talked about this when we talk about the water meth injection stuff, particularly on a tune port motor. So you, what you have is you have the Y pipe coming from the two intercoolers after the two turbos going into feeding the dual hole throttle body which unless it has the TPIS uh, little airfoil on it, has two, has two big old indents uh, recesses where fuel could get. And if you're spraying fuel in there, you're spraying fuel into a common square plenum. Then it has to go through, I don't know, 15 or 20 inches of runner length, whatever the, whatever the factory tune port is. Then the fuel has to find its way evenly to all those runners and then follow its path all the way around and crisscross across to the, to the cylinder heads and make their way in. Uh, Callaway, the guys were very, very sharp. I know. I remember we, we, uh, we raced with those guys in, in world challenge against those guys in world challenge. And so they're very, very sharp guys, but having done the testing that I've done now, I can almost guarantee you that it would be very, very difficult to have two additional ejectors spraying fuel into a tune port system and provide even air fuel distribution. I don't know how you, I don't know how you would do that. I mean, you could get it pretty good and for an acceleration run, it probably would work, <laughs> but <laughs> over the long haul, like for the silver state or something, <laughs> or even for a top speed test, maybe not so much. Um, but that didn't stop me from wanting one for forever and ever and ever having owned a, an 85 Corvette. And I, I, today, even today, I think that, that when you, when, when you show, and I, the photo that I used for my thumbnail was taken from the guys at, uh, bring a trailer. They, I think that they posted that for something. And so I gave them a photo credit for that, but that's a really, really impressive looking engine bay. As much as I like the tune port stuff, the tune port stuff with the intercoolers on either side of it make it look even better. But and that's the reason that I did my testing. I, I wanted to do a turbo a tune port motor because I wanted to, you know, I, I just wanted to boost a tune port motor. I hadn't done it before. So or I take that back. I hadn't done turbos on one or a turbo on one. And the guys way back then, my buddy Jimmy and Nathan from HP Performance had a kit for that Corvette. And so I decided to run it and I was amazed at how much torque it made. In fact, we thought that there was a problem initially. We're like, this thing's not really making very much power. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> it didn't start out making very much power. It started out making lots of torque and not very much power. 
you know, the, if you look at a tune port, the torque is a hundred more than the horsepower is. And then when we run the boost on it and if the boost is consistent, guess what happens that it, it stays that way. So what we ended up making was we ended up making almost an even 500 horsepower and 610 foot pounds of torque at eight, eight and a half pounds of boost. And this was, we were told by the guys at the Chevy race shop was a stock 1987 L98. I think it had some kind of cam in it, although it looked like the motor had never been apart. But that, you know, we tested it made 330 horsepower NA and 394 foot pounds. And when we run them, we, when we run them on the engine dyno, they're always, they always make more than they do that they're rated at because we run them with an open throttle body, a Mazira electric pump, no accessories, no air inlet. We ran it with long tube headers, no, no cap back exhaust. We run it cold. We run it with an optimized air fuel and timing, which the OEMs don't do. And so we always make more power than they do, but this was a lot more. I mean, this was 330 versus the 240 that it was rated at that's way more than we make the 394 foot pounds is within the range of what other things that we've kind of tested on tune port stuff i mean it's rated at three three this one's rated at 330 i i think uh later ones are rated at 345 so you know that's still that's still within the range of uh, the amount of power we would make more than the factory but the, the 330 numbers seem like it was camshaft related, but this thing idled dead smooth. It made peak power at 4,800. So again, I, I, <laughs> that's unknown. Uh, but you know, we only ran eight and a half pounds. And, and so the Callaway stuff ran much more, but they did have much lower compression and stuff. And we ran this just on a stock one, but I didn't you obviously use a micro fuel either. We, we put bigger injectors in it. We ran a, back then, we ran a fast XFI system and just controlled it, controlled the air fuel, controlled the timing. We ran 19 degrees of total timing on this thing. Um, I think we ran on pump gas with a, with a splash of 100 just to make sure that it was okay. We had a big front mount air-to-air -air intercooler, again, even though we were only at eight and a half pounds. All, all of that still worked out. And the if you look at the shapes of the two curves, of the NA curve and the turbo curve, because the boost was consistent with this, with this turbo, which was a whole set, I think a 70 millimeter whole set. And we had a good wastegate on it. Boost was consistent all the way through the tested curve. And the curve looked exactly like it did NA. It was just, just, just was more of it. It was just elevated everywhere. So it was very, very cool. But that was my homage to the Callaway twin turbo because I wanted to do a turbo. I knew that I could never afford one or that I, and, and when thinking about doing, hey, maybe I should do a twin turbo deal. Maybe I should make it look like the Callaway thing. Um, but trying to find those bare coolers, they were, they were not cheap and, and, and having to do the welding to reconfigure that. So it was just, it turned out to be too much. And then Jimmy said, Hey, look, we got a turbo kit for this. Let's want you to put that on there. And so I could do it and I did it and it was awesome. <laughs> and I highly recommend that, um, everybody have boost obviously in their life, even on a, even on a tune port motor. So... Okay, would the microfueler, the additional injector controller thing, offer optimum air flow distribution on a tune port motor? Seems like a pretty easy answer to one. So, scroll back. 100% no. That's good. That's what we like to hear. Okay, let's see. Yo, what's going on, Dylan? Good to see you guys. I fixed the water on the trans, took five gallons of flush. Oh, that's good. But it, it is working, though. That's very cool. I'm glad to hear that, man. Just saw Callaway C7. Yeah, they're still making stuff. So 
<laughs> you don't feel anything better than twin turbo? I'm I'm thinking that's a triple or a, or a quadruple. The, the Chuchinator. C4 Callaway Corvettes. I do too. I the like I said, the engine bay is they're just really impressive looking. I'm here betting. <laughs> I'm getting fed. Nice. Reef Callaway is such an awesome guy. That twin turbo TPI was awesome. B2K, that's right. The RPO number. Two things better than twin turbo vet are a twin turbo viper. Yes. Twin turbo vet with oh my you want a modular powered vet? How fast did the sledgehammer go? Like 250 something. Yeah, 256, he's saying. The early one had really tiny spinny boys. Sledgehammer. Yeah, that the sledgehammer was not at all what the what the production um Callaway Corvette was. Uh Ryan, what are you saying about Steve? I'm late, but could the blower increase in the compressor be blowing out the spark at number seven cylinders? No, we, I, I don't think we need to worry about blowing the spark out, given that we're only near or maybe even a little bit above NA power. I don't, I think, I mean, that's, that's what I suspect. At the four plus one seven speed and the crossfire was my favorite. I got to drive both the Sierra One Lotus and the 84 crossfire. And the AIT Turbo Fairlane, the first Australian car to use a microfueler. Yep. The microfueler was an auxiliary upstream central fuel injector. Yeah, it was an additional injector controller, basically. They had two, they had two injectors on their system. Any recommendations for a 5.3 liter twin turbo setup wanting to pull pull my whipple off and get more boost off idle? You're a, with turbos. You're not going to get more boost off idle than a than a positive displacement blower. Going to get me an early '90s vet and drop a coyote in it. Okay. Doug Nash four plus three or built turbo four hundred for the Callaways. You just copied what Dave Inall from Advanced Induction Technology was doing in Australia. Take a 149 horsepower EFI 6, put 106 horsepower out of, of turbo via a 5 liter CFI injector. I, I don't know why we have to, why it's important. <laughs> Never mind. Probably had plenty of response even with low compression. 4 6 swap. Like a fueler, wow, that takes me back. We used to use them on half J JZ engines, usually combined with the Gretti or HKS controllers, late 90s. Yeah, the additional injection, the AIC stuff that um, HKS used to sell a bunch of that stuff. I mean, that used to be the, the cool thing is when you'd have your glove compartment of your dash lined up with all these different <laughs> Gretti Profex or HKS AICs or all these things, um, you know, in your turbo car. Coolers do look cool. They do. Can you share about the sledgehammer Corvette? What would you want to share about it? Uh, Lingenfelter was responsible for that motor and uh, did a good job. I think John, I think John drove that car too, but that car was a dedicated built motor with bigger turbos and they, they eventually solved the problem with the inlets going into the turbos, but, but bigger turbos and more compression. And it was a much better NA motor, different intake manifold on it. Callaway set the land speed record in 1988 with a daily driver type car at 254. He, he never set a land speed record, uh, not like a Bonneville record or anything. He, he, they just went fast in that car. That's not, there's no official record for that. Are we talking about the Corvette mo motor built in Stillwater, Oklahoma? I don't know where Callaway was back in 87, where, where they were building those.
From what I remember, the intake was the biggest problem in producing more power, but didn't make a whole lot of torque. From my blurry memory, I remember bits and pieces of the sledgehammer. The, the tune port motor would have definitely limited power production because it just didn't want to make power at a higher engine speed. So what they did was built their own intake. John, I think, built they built their own intake manifold, which was a shorter runner deal, but still had the tune port looking throttle body on it. Will a retrofit big block Chevy roller cam work in a Gen 6 454? Uh, it will physically go in there, but a retrofit is going to have a different snout on it than a Gen 6 has. So it will, it will require a different timing gear. And I don't know if the retrofit will work with the factory cam retaining plate because they normally, a retrofit roller usually works with a cam button. Uh, I also don't know about the base circle of the retrofit big block cam. And I don't know. You'd have to check on that to make sure and to know what lifter you would run, if you whether you could run that retrofit roller cam with a factory hydraulic roller lifter and not have the oil feed band come out past the oiling holes um, if it's different. Kenny Detlar used the microfiller. It was they were big back in the day. Lots of them on, on Nissans and all, all kinds of turbo stuff. Callaway Alfa Romeo. I remember those. Those are cool. It was a Band-Aid for many years. <laughs> yeah. I know that the gradient intake manifolds on Supers used to work okay with pre-throttle body injectors on a stock manifold or worse NA systems. The original inline six turbo Falcon F. Yes, I always wanted to drive one. I still have the Hot Rod magazine with the Callaway vet on the cover. It's worn out, but I have it. Good. Let's see. Cylinder, cylinder, mixture variation. Yeah, I don't think a microfiller would be good for that. That needs to be on a t-shirt. Everyone should have boost in their life. That's right, right? I take it we still don't know what happened to your truck officially. Uh, I haven't been back down to do any testing. We took the blower off and just put it back NA, but I haven't run it. I haven't run it on the chassis dyno NA yet. What was your opinion on sequential turbos like the Supra and the RX-7? I, I like it. I like that idea. I think that that's cool. Anytime anytime people do things like VTEC or variable cam, VVT or sequential turbos to try to broaden the power band, I think it's pretty cool. What would two of the GT35s be good for? I think you could get to a thousand horsepower with those. Did you ever get a dual turbo set to work? I have run twin turbos on stuff. So which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the sequential one that I was talking about? Uh, Scott, we checked a lot of things. I, I still want to go back and check the coil packs. Um, we did drop the exhaust. A lot of guys mentioned that. And I we thought of that while we were there. And I talked those guys into staying late while I dropped the exhaust and we made a pull. And it did add power, but it didn't put it back up to where I thought it should be. Um, I want to get with this and just make sure that all of the um, all of the torque limiting stuff is off, uh, or or that the and that the transmission program we all on. I'm I'm not privy to that while he's doing it, so I just want to make sure. Share about all the arrow work they did the sledgehammer sledgehammer. That is the fastest blind man in the world at two eleven. In my seat. this is the fastest. Oh, you are Dan. The, um, they did a lot of arrow work on the Callaway. It had completely different body panels. And then when they did the sledgehammer stuff, they had to, um, reroute. They were having a problem with 
producing a low pressure area where the inlet of the turbos were. And so once they fixed that, they were restricting the turbos essentially. Once they fixed that, the boost came up and they, they made the power that they needed to. And then the thing went fast. Richard, did you make any of your Silver State runs with a T5? All of them were, were with a T5. All of them were with all 12 years worth. And every race that I ever ran in that car was with the original T5. It That original T5 was never hurt. Why could you not inject a tiny bit of propane on a center dump manifold to spool? I, I don't know. I guess you could try that. Best of the stock intakes for the L988 was the SLP Firehawk one. Yeah, that that one worked okay. Um, I have a test of it on my tune port deal, my tune port intake sh super shootout. Tim, what's going on? CF Transaxle on my old Pantera is pretty fun. In my garage is the connecting rod from Garth Neville's AIT Fairlane. I'm still stuck on the truck to understand why I didn't make power. We'll figure it out. It's, I'm sure it's something simple. Any mods for my 2004 Hyundai? You can always add boost to it. But, you know, cold air intake, of, if there's a header for it, or headers, exhaust, if there's tuning for it. Let's see. Much better the Siamese runner to work on TPI. I would imagine they'll raise the arc. Yeah, they want to make power at a different engine speed. They were down on power quite a bit down low. Scott, the motor, the truck's running fine now. I drove it all the way home. Callaway Alpha. Yeah, the twin turbo Alpha. That's pretty cool. Again, another engine bay that looked amazing. Your sequential turbo had an interesting pressure balance system in it. Yeah, it's probably way more complicated that way than it would be, as as people suggested, rather than just run two turbos that are the same and just bring the other one in. But the T5 is weak as glass, kind of like splitting. Yeah, and I ran mine. Most of its life, it spent with a Vortex supercharger and trick flow heads and, and the crane version of the 274 cam and some kind of intake, you know, a GT40 or a Cobra or something. Most of its life, it's spent doing that. And, and the T5 was never damaged. In fact, we took the T5 out of that transmission. I mean, out of that car. When I took the motor out and started running that motor at West Tech, we took that transmission out and ran it in our uh, Bridgestone supercar thing. And I used that transmission to race uh, a number of races, Long Beach and a couple of others. Um, PIR. Did a lot of aero work on my Land Speed C6 after reading about what Jim did on the sledgehammer. Yeah, they're they're pretty slippery cars, but they they can be made obviously even better. The previous C4 was a Callaway Supernatural. Four hundred ninety-nine point five horsepower. having an argument with a guy about how much power T5s can handle, treat them well, and they're fine. Yeah, mine lasted a really long time. And admittedly, a centrifugal supercharged motor is not, you know, going to smash it in the torque department. But still, that motor was fairly torquey because it was a long runner, almost always a long runner intake. I don't think I ever put any short runner intake manifolds on it. 
Your T5 never threw a fifth gear snap ring? No. And it ran uh, lugged out at full throttle for like a half hour in fifth gear. So picking a pair of big block Chevys last night. One had nicely ported peanuts. The other had a pe one peanut and one 049. <laughs> Your audio mic has a static glitch. Does anybody else hear that? I don't know why this mic would be glitchy. Mine let go in third and left the casing full metal shavings. It's not unusual. Third gear is not unusual to break. Guys, guys mostly break T5s when they're abusing them, which is the case with a lot of stuff. <laughs> I've, I've told you guys the story about the guy asking me if I've ever broke the shift handle off my transmission. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> that would not be a thing. Area 51. We called it Area 52, but... Uh, regarding T5, did you ever use fifth gear? We use fifth gear in the Silver State every time, obviously. And we didn't use, I don't remember using fifth gear in, I don't think we use fifth gear except maybe for Road Atlanta. I mean, Road America. Why is it that my 2017 GT with a 93 octane tune stage three Ford performance pack tune from them as well stumbles sometimes? Now I'm running E98 like a champ with the same tune, no stumbles. You're running E98 with a 93 pump gas tune? Those should not be anywhere near the same. Mine was a uh, SCHP interceptor <laughs> abused by the Hope Patrol who couldn't ship properly. Richard, what intake manifold do you recommend? Engine is a stock bottom end 5.3, ported 799s, 231, 750 in the street. Well, with that much cam, I, I'm, I'm almost certain you're going to, you're thinking single plane. And a Super Victor, I think, is probably the best one that I've tested. But maybe the Split Holly one would also be okay. I've never compared those two directly, so I don't know. A Callaway Corvette smoked me on a GS 1150 at 140. That just left me like I was parked. Wow. It has to be something specific to number seven hole, which might be coil injector or loose wire to the coil injector. Yeah, we're I, I want I want to test the coil. We tried everything else. We we tested the injectors and the wiring and the spark plug wire and the spark plug. We tested all that stuff. E98 is cooled into your 91, but it has up to 10% ethanol. Okay, I thought he was talking about uh some version of E85. I thought he was talking about race E85. You know, 85, 98 is even better, right? How's our poll doing? With the microfueler, additional injectors offer optimum air fuel distribution on the TPI motor. 35% are saying yes. Okay. Callaway E90 is 98% ethanol. See, I, I, that's what I thought 
but uh, Julius is saying E98 is equivalent to 91. I used to push fifth gear off its perch three or four times. Not really hard shifting, but still managed to do it. Got good at repairing them. Yeah, I don't, I never damaged mine. And I, I also, before I, I mean, I bought that car originally to go road racing. So I road raced it in many, many road races because that's the car that I got my SACA license in. So we road raced it a lot and shifted way more times during road racing than any drag racer has shifted their T5. So you can keep them alive. Yeah, Julius, I if if one of them is some sort of E85 kind of fuel and one of them is a gasoline fuel, like 91 or 93 pump gas gasoline, and one of them is E85, the tune would be 20 or 25% different for both of those. So it should be either wildly lean or wildly rich. Because I know when we, and this is pretty normal, when when we run pump gas, we start out with pump gas, which we do a lot, and then we put E85 in it. We have to change the we have to change the amount of fuel that we're supplying by a lot. Who who is? Who's Fidel saying Callaway and Galloway for, or Galloway? Who, who is that? Who is that directed to? I work on putting LS back together today. I have about 80 to 85,000 intake. Eight thousandths. Okay, intake valve clearance. I mean, second thoughts about using an 040 head gasket instead of the 53 I used previously. I have a six liter with a dual plane, Holly. Max RPM is 6,600 with a 6,650 double pumper. I'm close to the right size card for it. Inch and seven, eight headers. Does it have a stock camshaft in it? Paul, late to the show, the title grabbed my attention. We'll watch through later. And 09 Reeves reached out to me directly regarding single plane crankshafts. I mean, flat plane cranks? Is that what you're talking about? Had a few conversations with him. Saw so a three speed live behind an LS6 clone for a year. Was you careful getting on it? Yeah. Jake, I borrowed a few ideas from the Callaway B2K cars when I designed the twin turbo for my 85 C4 with T28s. That should be enough to make power. I've got to figure out how I'm fitting larger turbos in the next build. I, I think, and we talk about picking, you know, single turbo or twin turbos. A lot of times it's a fitment issue. And this is a perfect example. The The turbos that you could fit the way that he fit them, you know, you're there's a limited amount of space there because he had the, the turbos and the intercoolers and, and you have the exhaust manifolds and then you have exhaust manifolds out of the turbo and then you have the inlets going into the turbo. An awful lot of stuff has to fit in that area. So a lot of times you just can't fit all of it. I remember adding a Saab cold start injector activated by a hob switch above 15 PSI on my T2 GLH. I want to keep from going lean. Couldn't afford a market fuel. That's pretty common. That, that additional injector thing, a lot of guys have done, or, or their cold start injectors, that's pretty common. This LS has an aftermarket cam. So, 
So on your a six liter with a cam, I probably would run more than a 650. A 650 with a cam and an intake manifold is going to be, you know, sub 500 horsepower probably. But that's enough for a 750. Have you run a 428 Pontiac on a dyno? I have not. I've, the only Pontiac I've run, um, I've, I've run that 400 and then now the 350 of my own, or, or they're not mine, but the the 400 was not, but the 350 is. And then the Trophy four-cylinder, those are the only ones I've run. Other guys have run those, like um, Ken Croce from HO Racing has run a few things there. And I think other guys have run Pontiac stuff there. I don't know about a 428 though. I don't know if you want to try a flat plan crank with that kind of displacement on an overhead valve engine. Yeah, I'd, I I would be surprised if Callaway was looking into that on an L98. There's there's so many other limitations that I don't I don't know why you'd be considering that on on that particular motor. All right, BS. We'll talk to you later, man. TPI with a GT45 uh, <laughs> rips. It, it should. It's, it's it's very torquey, right? Too far from the cities to get E85, Julius. I know, I know. I, I want a rotary. I saw two cars on um, fa Facebook, on Marketplace that I wanted. One was the RX-7, and the other one recently was a, what was that one? Oh, a twin stick Colt. That needs a little bit of work. <laughs> What's up with Oliver? I talked to him too long ago that the 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 Nova's running around. It has a small block in it, which is good. It doesn't have a leaky, smoky 6.2 diesel in it anymore. I'd like to know Callaway's influence on Chevy with regards to the Grand National. Why? Why would you think that he would be that he would have been part of that? There, there are other Buick guys that um, influenced that before the Grand National, back when it was a back when it was just a regular carbureted turbo V6. I can tell quite a bit of difference in the power as well. So should I stop switching back and forth? Yeah, if it's if it's hesitating or whatever, maybe it's detonating and maybe you're going to hurt it. The better, the higher octane gas would be better. TPI GT45 setup was in an 85 C30 Suburban. And I'm going, oh, twin compound. Wish someone would actually fix the vector V8. Yep. I think that the vector, the problem was never the the engine. I think it was always the the transmission. I know that they was doing Tornado transaxles. I think way back when he first started that modified versions of that. But and I and I remember seeing vectors with Lamborghini drivetrains in them. But the I think that the turbo V8 thing was always pretty easy to make all the power. Six point two diesel, but I you know his was a turbo, so not a two non turbo motor that he had, and then he added a turbo to, which makes it you know, which you know, tip of the hat to Oliver because that's awesome. So we're at sixty two percent saying no. That's still good. My Ranger has one from Humby. Oh, nice. 
85 Suburban had a 6.2 stock in it. That was a tosser. I got a shipment from Summit. Uh, I got my, well, I bought stuff, so I <laughs> paid for it. But I got my U-Bins, got my, what else did I get? I got the U-Bins and the 250 pump for the truck and something else. What else did I order? Oh, couplers. Couplers, because I would go three and a half to four inch orange inlets, which I'm excited about. Your truck needs some long tubes. My truck probably needs, um, well, I, you know, I dropped these off and we, and it did change the power a little bit. So we know that there's some power to be had in a stock exhaust, but actually I would like to see uh, a new exhaust on that truck with, with mufflers that are not stick welded in place. Any cheap options for fuel injectors for a 5.3? Yeah, you could do decap ones or snake eaters or 80 pounders or what most people do. Do the exhaust or big pipes? Nah, I don't want any of that. I want, I, it, it's, it, it has some sort of muffler on it now and it bore, it's borderline too loud. Uh, monkey, will a rammer system like the Firebird or something a little more simple add or make a positive pressure in your intake make you go faster? Uh, I doubt a an actual ram air setup where you provide positive pressure is actually kind of difficult to do. It's hard to get positive pressure. It's hard to get a measurable positive pressure. But what you're trying to do is not have negative pressure on the inlet, and most and most importantly, you're trying to get cold air. So if you can get cold air, you're most of the way there. Decapinator injectors, that's right. Although you can't just get eight of them. <laughs> you have to get a bunch of them. Found an 86 vet at the junkyard today with a 4 plus 3. A Super T10 with a Doug Nash overdrive. Turbos are kind of like mufflers, that's right. Roll on Dana 79, Dana 60s with four ton lockers. Are you gonna going to do testing on hot side turbo pipe widths? You you want like a Y pipe change or something? The the engine diner really isn't a good place because that would only be response rate is is what most people are interested in for Y pipe stuff. I don't think we would see. That's a difficult thing to do on, on an engine dyno because of the way that the engine dyno loads. We're artificially loading it and already having plenty of response there. I, I think a guy would be really hard pressed to measure two and a half versus three inch on a on a good v8 you still have your five liter mustang yes i do original owner it doesn't have a motor in it right now looking for daily and found a clean owner o2 civic si 166,000 miles i don't really know what what i didn't even know that that they had a 2002 SI. Is that the little... Is that the, is that the hatchback one? With the K-series in it? I hate clicking on something and having it be a bunch of BS. Okay, yeah. No, those are cool. 
those are the those aren't the um those aren't the 200 horsepower versions those are the 160 horsepower versions but those are cool i i like all civics uh coyote for a five liter no your experiment with fmu and a factory tune to make boost on a v8 that would be interesting to see how well you can make one work um we already did that look at the video on the i don't know if i put it up in the air fuel in fact i i kind of wanted to talk about that because i was thinking about that today i was amazed but i thought i talked about it in the video we ran an fmu because it was part of the kit for the kenny bell that we put on that motor with mark sanders it ran on the chassis dyno that video is up and i talked about the fmu i think in that video but it worked amazingly well i was pleasantly surprised monitored the fuel pressure on it to see what the change in fuel pressure was as it turned out I just couldn't keep up with the fmu but the falling um the slightly falling boost or, or fuel pressure curve actually worked fairly well the the, the uh air fuel with that blower when we put the blower on in the fmu the air fuel curve was really really nice and twin turbo kit gonna start install next week what is the most in first part first time install i i've never put one in a vehicle i've only i've only run i ran a hellion single kit on a on a uh, coyote before i have a corvette 91 with tpi anything i do with this engine yeah same thing as every other small block you can put rockers on it you can put ported heads on it you can put cams in it you just have to be able to tune it um lots of different systems you could change from that tune port a lot of variations of that All right, Scott, I'll see you, man. How do you tune it without an EEPROM? Well, you, that's what you have to do. You're going to have to get some sort of tuning software. Twin Turbo TPI. It is. A, a Twin Turbo TPI is kind of like a diesel motor. <laughs> Yeah, you have to. Well, yeah, you you have you're gonna have to tune it if you put a cam in it or any of those things. It, it's gonna have to be tuned. And I think that those are. I can't remember which years were mass error and which ones were speed density. Any friends going to sick week? I don't. I don't really. I don't get involved too much in that sort of racing. I'd like to. I'd actually want to go there with my buddy Jimmy and his NSX. So about going aces efi yeah any sort of standalone uh, efi would allow you to do that you just need to put a different um i think you just need to put a different distributor we normally use an msd distributor that plugs into our either a holly or a fast or whatever and then we and then we run those that's what i did when i did all the testing with um all the tune port manifolds we ran a standalone management system work really really well Or, or a terminator you could use that i mean if it's if it's going to stay na then the, the there are lots of probably inexpensive ecus that you could use and then you could use you you could even just take the fuel injection off put a carburetor <laughs> put a carburetor and distributor in a dual plane manifold and it will it will make more power Come on, Jewish, don't downplay flash tuners, man. I set I set records with a Honda S100. <laughs> Burned a lot of chips. My buddy worked at Callaway when they made the Sledgehammer Corvette. <clears throat> I was told Aces would do boost. M most standalone stuff will do that, yeah. I'm doing a 2017 Coyote twin turbos mounted on the bottom. Put twin turbos on a Chevy 305. In a 89L turbo Fox body SCT made 600 wheel horsepower. Yeah, a factory ECU can make it. it and I, I actually like the drivability of the um, 
I was telling that to Mark. I said, I, I actually like the drivability of the of the factory Ford computer. And I have an A9L in that, and I think I have an A9L in that um in that Mustang. Why did why did why did you freak out? Come on, cooperate. Ah, stupid thing. Asus has two O2 sensors. Might try it with a Windsor build. Okay. How about if you adjust and cooperate like you're supposed to? Where where are you focusing it? Like, there we go. My 54 Cadillac has twin 3582s on a tune port 305. Okay, that's good. That's good. We've got one more minute. So we're going to turn off our poll at 59% or saying no. I, I don't know how additional injectors feeding an intake manifold like that could have good distribution, but I don't know every darn thing. <laughs> I don't know everything. Or sometimes it seems like anything. Did you put the battery in the back of your Fox? I did. I, I trunk mounted my battery um, in the Fox and didn't secure it one time. And it rolled around when I was road racing one time and came out of the box and then shorted itself. And the car turned off. <laughs> I learned after that that you have to secure the battery down much better. I didn't understand the question enough to vote. The question was just if you put like additional injectors uh, somewhere, you know, one or two of them somewhere in the inlet before the throttle body and spray them into the manifold. Will they get everywhere evenly? The answer is no, it won't. I built a brace. Yeah. I think I just used a strap or something and connected it to the X brace. Just, you know, you got to get out and drive it around and feel it. You can't spend time like making a bracket for it. Just you know, being a dumb kid. That happens. On that note, it is time to go. Hopefully you guys are all doing well. Uh, I'm not sure about the next video that I'm putting up. If you haven't taken a look, go look at the, the last video that I put up. That's on the truck. I'm, we're still trying to work that out. In fact, I got to go take a code right now. It's, it has a it has a check engine light, so I need to find out what it is. I'm thinking it's when we disconnected the O2 sensors, when we dropped the exhaust that it got unhappy. But um, I'll check and see, and then we'll, we'll let you guys know what's going on. I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Maybe tonight.